This is Democracy Now!, The Quarantine Report. I'm Amy Goodman. As we turn to Egypt, where coronavirus infections are continuing to rise, threatening to overwhelm the healthcare system. As the government of President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi grapples with the pandemic, it's cracked down, arresting doctors, journalists, lawyers who dare to speak out. Today, we take a look at one family who's been particularly targeted, arguably the most prominent activist family in Egypt. But first, we go to Cairo to speak with Democracy Now! correspondent Sharif Abdel Kadus about about the coronavirus crackdown, it being used as a pretext for arrests, to talk about the interview that he did. Hi, Sharif. Talk about what's happening right now in Egypt. Well, Amy, as you mentioned, over the past few months, as the coronavirus has spread in Egypt, the state's been trying um, even more viciously than usual uh, to control the message and to clamp down on any real or even perceived opposition. So, as you mentioned, uh, dozens of people have been arbitrarily arrested, including at least 10 doctors who are being increasingly targeted, uh, six journalists, lawyers, activists, and so on. And also, as the country went into a partial lockdown in March, uh, the Ministry of Interior suspended all prison visitations for the families of detainees. Uh, so prisoners have uh, largely been cut off from their families for the last four months. Uh, and unlike nearly every other country in the Middle East, uh, Egypt has not released thousands of prisoners as a precaution against the coronavirus. Instead, it's arrested more people and cut off communication. Um, so, um, you know, among the leading voices for prisoner rights in Egypt is the safe family. Um, the eldest son, Al Abdel Fattah, uh, was a leading figure of the 2011 revolution. He was released from prison last year after serving a five-year sentence on trumped-up charges. Uh, during his brief time out, he had an additional five years of probation, where he had to submit himself to a police station for 12 hours every day from 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. Uh, he was rearrested in September, and he remains behind bars in pretrial detention. Now, Alat's mother, uh, Leila Swif, and his two sisters, Mona and Sene, uh, have been tireless advocates for Alat and for prisoners in general. Uh, they've constantly challenged prison authorities, uh, challenged the uh, judicial system uh, to fight for the rights of Ala and other prisoners. Uh, they've gone on hunger strikes, have done actions, they've raised awareness, they're constantly speaking out, and all of them uh, have been arrested at different times for their activism. Uh, in 2014, both Ala and Sanet were in prison at the same time, and their father, uh, the prominent uh, human rights lawyer Ahmed Saif died of a heart condition while they were inside. Uh, just this past March, uh, Leila and Mona were arrested um, and released the next day after holding a small protest to call for the release of prisoners amid the coronavirus outbreak. Um, and then as prison visitations were suspended, communication cut off, they stepped up their actions. And this kind of came to a head two weeks ago when Sene and Mona and Leila were physically assaulted um, after spending the night outside the prison, uh, demanding that authorities allow them to receive a letter from Ale. Sana in particular was very badly beaten. Um, and when they went to the public prosecutor's office the next day, uh, Sana was forcibly taken by plainclothes security forces. Um, and uh, prosecutors later, um, a few hours later, ordered her to be imprisoned for 15 days uh, in pretrial detention, an order that can be renewed for months or even years. And Sana, who's only 26, uh, has already spent over a year and a half in prison in two separate cases. Uh, so now Sharif. both Alain and Sanar are in prison at the same time. And uh, I sat down with Leila Swaif um, a couple of days ago to talk about so all of this. So let's go to this interview, this first broadcast exclusive interview that you did with her since her daughter Sana's arrest. Thank you for joining us, Leila Swaif. Um, your daughter Sana was arrested nearly two weeks ago. The prosecution ordered Sana to be held in pretrial detention for 15 days. Yeah. Do you expect her to be getting out anytime soon? I hope so. I, I, yeah, you, you can never tell. It's possible that they will just continue to renew her. But it is also possible that because of all the circumstances around her arrest, uh, that it, it, it will not just go into this routine of just renewing. I think it really depends on how much uh, of a headache we can create for the prosecutor. <laughs> uh, maybe if we can create a large enough headache about the fact that this is a cover-up for a kidnap, <laughs> maybe, may, maybe she, she, she will be released. I have, I'm, I'm not sure. I... Two of your three children, Sana and Ale, are now in prison. Uh, this has happened before in 2014. Um, what's it like for you now that they're both once again locked up? It hasn't sunk in that Sana is actually in prison. It's like, <laughs> like she went away for a while. 
<laughs> I have to remember to walk her dog, feed her dog. <laughs> I think uh, it's going. I suppose it's going to be like like before, except, okay, the first time was very tough because my husband was very sick and he uh, he went he went into coma and he died while they they were in prison. It was really really tough. And I think yeah, yeah I said she managed. I said about Sana a, a little while ago that she managed her pri imprisonment. But she, what really hit her was losing her father while she was in prison. That hit her. That hit her. That has left scars that show suddenly, and that show to this day suddenly there are times when it just all comes out. And uh, yes, hopefully nobody is going to die while in prison this time. Hopefully. <laughs> So, so let's hope yeah, I mean, it won't be such a traumatic experience. When's the last time you spoke to Ale? Uh, before the, just, uh, just a week before the lockdown. Like it was so two March, three March, something like that. So about four months ago. Yes. Is that the longest time you haven't heard your son's voice? Yes, absolutely. Yes, absolutely. And, and even even when he was working in South Africa, and I think we talked on the phone like once a week or something. I used to get these horrible builds. Well, how how's that experience that you can't hear his voice? That there's just communication through a letter once in a while. Uh, and you, in part, with Ala in particular, it's, it's, it's very tough because Ala, and Ala is the, the person I, uh, I talk with, you know, Ala is the person I talk with about science fiction novels and uh, uh, the stupidity of, uh, of people who don't understand the probability and, <laughs> and probabilistic dangers, and Ala is the person I talk with. So, four months without talking to Ale, it's really any. You and your family have consistently been trying to put pressure on authorities. Uh, you've been arrested, you've been physically assaulted. Do you ever get afraid of the repercussions? I mean, what gives you strength to keep doing this? I'm always afraid of the repercussions. Nobody, nobody can be not, cannot, particularly as the repercussions fall on other people. Maybe I'm not that afraid about, I'm, I'm 64, it doesn't matter what happens to me anymore anyway. <laughs> but I'm certainly afraid of what, what can happen to my daughters. I was, af when we were arrested, I was, af I was afraid for Adef and Rabab. I'm always afraid. But, uh, I think it, yeah, yeah, I wanna, we can't even give up because Ala is in prison. And yeah, and you can't decide, okay, I'm not going, I'm, I'm going to stop. How can I stop? Ala is in prison. <laughs> and when Ala was out of prison, he was in, in this horrible muraba thing where he had to be, spend the night, uh, every night in, in, in the police station, etc. And he's not. So you actually don't have an option. And, and the option of not doing anything is not there. This, this is not a regime which will allow, and which will leave you alone if you're quiet. And I've learned during my life that what, what, if there's something that where you don't have an option, you just do it the best way you can. And this is long training, long training. <laughs> I'm claiming <laughs> you, you, you translate things to to actual actions. You, you don't think about you. You don't sit down and think about the consequences. You don't sit down and think about the years that are flying by. You, you just you know translate it into practical tasks, and you finish the tasks. Like I have to finish the dishes. I have to finish this. Uh, uh, petition, you know, uh, for enable I am, etc. Your family has had long and difficult experience with prisons in Egypt, and two of your children are now in prison. How has all of this affected your family? Yeah, 
and it's it's okay. It's put all in a way. It, it, it's put all of our careers on hold. Mona should have by now have done a PhD. She hasn't. I'm still a university professor, and I still teach, but I, I haven't man managed to do research for years now. I mean, uh, you sort of are forced into becoming uh, a full-time human rights activist, which we actually are not. I mean, the only one who was a human rights lawyer was Saif, my husband. Uh, before, here he died. I'm, I'm a professor of mathematics. Sala is a software developer. Mona is a biologist. Sana is a film editor. We, and you, we, but you end up, you know, doing the, all this around your other things. Yeah. So what are you calling for now? Oh, I'm. I'm okay, mainly. I'm still calling for what I called for when I stood outside Maglis Lozara and was arrested, that because of COVID-19, there should be massive releases of prisoners. This is the only way to, uh, to make sure that there is not uh, uh, hundreds of prisoners who will be sick and, and maybe die and so on. And there are thousands, actually. So this is the initial demand. In the meantime, while this is not happening, prisons should not be locked down. There should be either the visits should be reopened, or at least there should be telephone calls or stuff like that. And finally, Taban, I'm demanding the release of Ale and Sene because they are both on pre-trial detention, and these are only the urgent demands. We need the authorities to take COVID-19 seriously. We need authorities to spend money on hospitals, on doctors, on protecting doctors. We need the authorities to stop arresting doctors to talk about the problems of COVID-19 and many things. Sana had said that she had lost hope for change. What about you? What gives you hope? Uh, that I, for me, what is hap even what is happening now, uh, nightmarish as it is, it is change. I have lived a lot, very long time. I keep saying there is a very big difference between being part of a popular movement that is in retreat and that has been vanquished and, and being part of a very small elitist movement, which is how things were from the 80s to 2011. I, for me, even this nightmarish situation is change. The fact that I get thousands of people talking about Ale, the fact that th this is completely, the, the fact that I get, the fact that when we, uh, even when we talk about a very controversial issue uh, like uh, homophobia or whatever, we get thousands of supporters. This, none of this, none of this. Yani, I, I, I compare to the past, I compare this to the first time Safe took up uh, uh, a case, the Queen Boat case, uh, a case about homosexuals. And nobody, and he had to fight with human rights lawyers. <laughs> okay? Now, no human rights lawyer would say, no, this shouldn't be this case. <laughs> At that time, nobody would touch it. Almost, almost nobody. <laughs> uh, no, there we have other. Okay, uh, and part I, uh, I, I sincerely believe that part of the viciousness of this regime is the fact that it is, it, it, it feels that it feels outstripped by events. What do you mean? Everything, yani, yani. So, the, 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 so many people are making jokes about them. So many people are, uh, so many young people are doing things that nobody imagined before. So, 
basically. And they're trying to curb all, all that viciously. Look at the doctors. Okay, they, they arrest the doctor because he's talked about corona. Next day, there is another doctor who's talking about about condition. They, 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 they are. And they are being very vicious, but actually they are not managing to control things. And I think the part of the viciousness is that. Okay, so there is a difference. There is a, a, a very I can see it in young people. They are they are angry. They are not. Uh, they are put upon. They are being, but they are not accepting it lying down. Uh, for me, a, ch a change has happened, and this change will have to bear fruit at some point. But many people are disheartened and feel demoralized by what's happening now, both in Egypt and some places abroad as well. Uh, you seem to strike a more hopeful tone. All, all these uh, uh, authorities who are disheartening us, like Sisi and like Trump and like... Anyone can see that they are not going to get a, a, a stable system, okay? And, and you can have an unstable system that goes on for a long time, but, but it's not, it's never, we can see, anyone can see that it's not, never going to be a stable system. I, there are always chances in an unstable system. I mean, there are always chances. You might be able to make use of them, you might not, but there are always chances. Are you following the uh, mass protest movement against police violence in the U.S., and how does it resonate for you? Sure. I, I've, I've always thought, since 2011, I've always thought that what we have, what, what is being born is an international movement against authoritarianism, against this kind of thing. I, I, and that there is, there is, okay, there is a difference, but it's only a difference in quality, not uh, in quantity, not in quality between police in, in the states and police in Egypt and I don't know, police in England, <laughs> police in France. These are the countries I know. I'm glad that people are rising. I am hoping that I, I, I. I I say, every time I see people rise against authoritarianism, against police brutality, anywhere in the world, this gives me hope because I, to me, for me, this is a movement that has to happen all over the world. That's Leila Swift, mathematics professor and mother of Alaa and Sene. She was interviewed by Democracy Now! correspondent Sharif Abdel Kudus in Cairo, Egypt. An online petition has been launched at Change.org calling on Egypt's attorney general to release prisoners being held in pretrial detention and to allow Alaa Abdel Fattah and other prisoners to communicate with their families and for the release of Sana Saif. That does it for today's broadcast. I'm Amy Goodman. Thanks so much for joining us. Wear a mask and stay safe.